Hi, I'm Ree from mummyof4.com. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video, I'm going to explain exactly what goes on in an ADOS assessment, which is an assessment to diagnose autism. I'm specifically today going to talk about a module three ADOS assessment because that is the one that my daughter has literally just gone through. We've gone through the assessment, we're waiting for the results. So it's really fresh in my mind. I wanted to just explain everything that went on and that way hopefully if you are going through the diagnosis process yourself or if you have got a child that you have concerns that may have autism, you kind of know what's to expect. Now I have already got another video which is our autism journey up until this point. So that covers everything up until the ADOS assessment. So if you haven't watched that yet, I shall link that below. Go and watch that first and then come back to this one. But this video kind of follows on from that one. Now I do want to just sort of preface all this by saying I am not a doctor. I am not an expert, a trained expert in autism. I am just a mum of children one of which has an autism diagnosis and another one of which has gone through this process and has literally just had the ADOS assessment. So the information in this is kind of as factually accurate as I can make it, but obviously, as with everything, if you have any concerns at all, go and speak to your own doctor, your own health visitor, your child's school, speak to people in your own area that are your child's primary care providers to make sure that you are getting the right information that's relevant in the area where you are in the world because it can vary from place to place. With that out of the way, before we kind of dive into it all, I just want to say if you are new here, welcome. Please subscribe, hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos every Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday at 7 p.m. I do post videos about our autism journey, but also I do kind of daily life videos, parenting tips, tricks, hacks and advice shop with me's haul, speed cleans, all that kind of stuff. I hope you'll love it. Now let's get on to explaining exactly what happened in my daughter's ADOS assessment module three. So what is an ADOS anyway? ADOS simply stands for the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. This is a widely used form of diagnosis. It is a very structured form of diagnosis where it's standardized, so an ADOS performed in different areas would follow the same protocol, the same procedures, and the same marking criteria to make it kind of as standardized as possible. Little sort of tests are given to the person who is being um, assessed, and then they are marked, and those marks are added up in order to form a diagnosis. So what is module three anyway? And if your child is having a diagnosis, which module will they do? Module one is for non-verbal children or children that only have single word language. Module two is for children with phrased speech or kind of limited non-fluent speech. Now, module two is the module that my son had when he was coming up to four. So that's kind of the module that preschoolers would generally be given. Now, the module that my daughter had is module three. She has just turned five. Now, children of that age would normally, by all accounts, be given module two, but during the speech and language section of the social communication clinic, she was assessed at having spoken language equivalent to a seven-year-old. So because her language is fluent, she was given module three. And then there is also module four, which is for adults who are verbally fluent. So what happens before the ADOS and how do you get there? Now I cover this in detail in my other video and blog post, which is all linked below. But in a nutshell, you need to get referred, which is by your health visitor pre-age five and by the school post-age five in this area. Check exactly what the deal is in your area. Then you get referred to a specialist, like again, this is just the experience that we've had going through the health system rather than the school system, but it is referred to the specialist. And then you have an initial meeting where you kind of talk through everything. Then there are in-depth questionnaires sent out. So they sent them to the children's schools and I filled them out as well. And then we have the social communication clinic, which again is all gone over in depth in that previous video. And from there, we then get to the ADOS assessment. And it's the ADOS assessment that forms the final kind of 
diagnosis and also the level of diagnosis, whether it would be mild autism, moderate autism, severe autism, or not needing a diagnosis, so, or therefore be neurotypical. So um, anyone who does not have autism is called neurotypical, and someone with autism would say on the autism spectrum or have autism. Where does the ADOS take place? is another question I've heard a lot. For us, we went to see the specialist in an NHS children's clinic, and they do other things there, you know, for uh, children with other disabilities, or needing physiotherapy, or whatever it might be, as well as autism. And we actually went back, so we'd already been to the same place for the social communication clinic and the other meetings and things, and the ADOS was held there. Another question I get a lot is, can you be present for the ADOS assessment? Now, ideally, no. And the reason for this is that parents kind of feel this need, and it's, it's what we do with our children, to kind of jump in and help them, and to kind of prompt them, or give them a little look, and coach them almost, and that does not sort of give a fair scientific test, and the test is all about kind of being very standardised and making sure that the results aren't skewed by anything. So, in a nutshell, no. Um, in my experience, we're not allowed to be present for the test. However, we were allowed to watch through one-way glass, so the children being assessed, and the, the children are assessed one at a time, it's one child, and then there is one um, speech and language therapist who I will refer to from here on in as the therapist, just, you know, for ease. So there's the therapist, um, then there was my daughter, and then there was the consultant who was kind of just taking notes and assessing. I believe the whole thing was filmed as well so that they can refer back to that as well as their notes. I'm not entirely sure about that, but the, I know there was filming equipment and it said that um, things would potentially be filmed. Um, and then I was allowed to watch through the in the next room so um, Bella could just see herself in a mirror and I could see through, you know, like in police dramas and things so yeah we were watching through the one-way mirror and I could hear it most things the sound quality wasn't brilliant so I missed a few bits but I could hear most of what was being said over a speaker in the next room I get asked a lot is it easy to follow along with the assessment now I will say yes and no to this so for my son's assessment they immediately gave me a sheet of paper um, and it was four years ago and it's foggy, if I'm honest. My memory of these things are foggy. I think it was quite a stressful time. I don't know if I like suppressed some of it, but anyway. They handed me this sort of sheet of paper and I was reasonably easily able to follow along what they were doing and sort of the marking criteria. I was already quite well read on autism at this point. So I feel if I hadn't, if I didn't know anything about autism, I would have found it a little trickier. It was quite simple. The things they do with the children are very basic. So I was trying to analyse what they were looking for in each little task or test. Um, and just to say very briefly, the children don't feel like it is a test. They just feel like they're playing a series of games and doing a series of activities. So it was all very structured in a very kind of nursery schooly kind of way in my experience. They were very sweet with them. So it wasn't like Ugh, test conditions. Um, the children were just very much doing little games and things. So it wasn't super obvious on the face of it what they were looking for, even with the sheet. Like I found it much easier to follow the module two with my son. I felt like that they, I don't know whether they just did that in a more of a linear fashion. With the module three, I did ask, they didn't volunteer the piece of paper with that, so I asked them for the marking criteria, um, and they were more than happy to give it to me. Uh, but I'm not sure if I would have had if I hadn't asked for it, so if you um, are about to have an ADOS assessment for your child, do make sure that you ask for that, because it certainly made it a little easier to follow what they were doing. But it was just more of a kind of, with the level three, like boxes of, it didn't list out the task that they were going to do and then the what they were looking for underneath it it had a kind of a grid of various things they were looking for and I felt that they darted around a bit more with the module three and I don't know if that was because perhaps with more fluent children they allow the child to lead a bit more this is kind of the conjecture but you see this is the thing I don't fully know the answer to I don't know if they always plan to follow that exact route for the test or if they were being led a bit more by my daughter I don't know um, I would have to ask them I don't know. And so Williams, module two, I followed along with reasonably easily. And I think it was more straightforward, perhaps because his symptoms or the kind of signs he was displaying were more typical autism symptoms and signs. You know, he had lack of eye contact and 
uh, very scripted speech, that kind of thing. By the way, I have got another video all about signs of autism. If you haven't seen that, make sure you go and check that out after this video because that might be interesting to you. So when I just talk about the signs, that um, then that explains that in a lot more depth over there. Anyway, he was showing more kind of typical signs. My daughter, however, who is five, like I said, spoken language of a seven-year-old, very high functioning, and girls by all account mask things a lot better. So I do think that her, what they were looking for with her was a lot more subtle. I know that they def they told me that on the day with William, when he was four, that yes, we were looking at autism and we would come back for the full results. They told me before they even did the assessment with Bella, they would not be able to give me any form of indication on the day because it would be down to a lot more sort of finely tuned marking. It was never gonna be as obvious with the module three as the module two. Now I'm assuming that's because she was more fluent, so I don't know if that's all module threes are kind of not that obvious and it really needs to be marked more carefully. You'd have to speak to your individual doctor, but as a general rule of thumb, you don't get the results on the day, you do the, the full assessment, and then they go away and mark it and analyze it and they will bring you back. So we had the ADOS for Bella the last couple of days of January, and then two weeks later, we're having the um, meeting where they explain the results to us. So there is that two week gap where they do all the marking and the assessing of really nitty gritty what went on in there. I get asked a lot about will the assessment be stressful for the child. Um, I would say in my experience my children pretty much enjoyed them because they were a series of games. I did touch on this earlier. They didn't find them stressful. They do perhaps find them a little bit tiring because it is one task after another task and asking them to kind of do that um, for a long period of time. I think Bella's ADOS took about an hour, so it was quite intense. I felt quite sort of drained after it because I was frantically trying to take notes to make sure I could share everything with you guys. In this video, I am gonna share exactly the sort of little tasks and things and break down exactly how I think she performed in each one of them. I will share all that with you. But so yeah, I found it quite intense. She was not upset by it at all. If your child, obviously, finds it difficult to be apart from you, perhaps they'll find it more stressful if they have more sensory issues. You just don't know how, a, a, even a neurotypical child, let alone a child with autism, may react in these situations. But in my experience, my children did not find them stressful. The staff there were so lovely and they pretty much enjoyed them, if I'm honest. So let's get down to what exactly happens in the Module 3 ADOS assessment. One more time, I am gonna say this just so that you know. I'm going to share with you exactly what happened and what I witnessed and what I saw. And then I'm also gonna share with you how I believe my daughter may have scored on each individual task and whether I saw signs of autism through the one-way glass in my non-doctor brain. So I don't know as much as the professionals. I still don't know which kind of diagnosis she's gonna come out with. I can't be sure about that, but I will share with you what I saw and what they did with her because as I understand it the activities they actually do with the children are pretty standardized. First activity they did they gave Bella a piece of paper and it had like zigzags on it then they had puzzle pieces that were the same shape and they would fit onto the piece of paper so they had all these jigsaw pieces and the therapist had most of them in her hands and she handed Bella like a few of them and asked her to put them onto the page and then she held the rest, the therapist held the rest and sort of carried on writing and things. And I think what they were testing for here, it didn't say on the sheet, this is just conjecture, but I believe what they were testing for here was would Bella ask for more puzzle pieces when she need them or just take them? Because a child with autism, it is my understanding, is more likely to just reach and take them rather than use their verbal skills to ask for them. And Bella didn't ask for them, she just reached across the table and even when the therapist kind of pulled them back a little bit, she just reached for them. So she, there wasn't that kind of, okay, this is another human, I should ask for them. I was really surprised at this actually because, I mean, if you follow me on Instagram, you've seen in we had the videos, I was sort of always trying to drum into my children manners and things, so I was a little bit mortified, but then if that just, just perhaps a sign of autism. Because she is normally very good with pleases and thank yous and knows when to use them. This was, I guess, a bit of an alien situation for her. She was in a new place. But I was surprised anyway that that's what she did. She didn't verbalize 
I think that's what they were looking for, can't be sure, but so I don't know. How do you think your child would react in that situation? Would they use language or would they just kind of go to take things? After this, they just chatted a lot. They talked about um, Bella, has, who has a birthday in December. Last time we were there in the social communication clinic, she was talking to the therapist about this pretend birthday she was going to have in school where I was going to send her in with a birthday badge and things. Um, not on her birthday, but just during a school day so they could sing at her and things. Um, and the therapist was quite keen to talk to her about this pretend birthday and, and how it had gone. Now, Bella didn't really engage with the conversation. She sort of went off on a tangent and talked about her own thing. Now, it is quite possible they would have scored this as an autism trait because children with autism are more likely to go off on a tangent and talk about what they want to talk about as opposed to how the conversation is going. So I don't know if this was just chit chat to keep her going or part of the test, but if it was part of the test, then I'm pretty sure that's how she would have scored. Next, they brought out a picture book and then they were talking about the characters in the book and asking Bella to look at their faces and guess what they might be thinking and how they might be feeling in the different situations in the picture book. Now again what I assume they're looking for here is whether the child was to talk about any of the emotions at all. If they saw someone with a sad face would they say that they were feeling sad or would they just talk about what they were thinking? Bella barely touched on the emotions. She again I think this surprised me a bit but she didn't really talk about how any of the characters were feeling she talked quite a lot about what they might be thinking or what they might be doing but barely touched on whether they might be feeling happy or sad or anxious or anything like that which I think I expected her to do that and she didn't then there were questions about the future now this was part of the the kind of assessment because there was a section about this in the sheet that I had and they asked her they asked her whether she'd like her own house in the future and what she'd like to do for a job to which Bella replied well that's ages away I'm only five so I'm not quite sure how she would have scored there she just didn't really want to discuss it I'm not sure I'll have to wait and see how she scored in that bit can't really comment but she really, really was not interested in talking about that so for the next activity the therapist brought out a little bag full of really random toys there was like a dinosaur and a jug and a few little people characters and a spanner and a couple of little tools just really really random things and she said right let's play together I'm gonna be this man and um, I think his name's gonna be whatever and then who do you want to be Bella picked up a person and she was very very fixated on getting this person to hold this little object in their hand and she was not really interested in chatting at all. Now children with autism do get very fixated on very small details. I know that the speech and language therapist had commented on this during their, her speech and language assessment how she'd become very fixated on what might have been broken or what, what went with what rather than the actual play. So the fact she became very very fixated on this I don't know whether that would have formed part of her score but definitely it had previously been pointed out as a sign of autism. So the therapist is saying right I'm with this toy which one do you want to be and so she's got her toy and she's fixated on what it's holding. So then the therapist says right okay hi I'm looking for my friend I'm really worried about him because there's a dinosaur on the loose and he's got a blue top. She really specifically described this other toy that was lying on the table that Bella could quite clearly see. She's like have you seen my friend have you seen him anyone I'm really worried about him and Bella's just holding her character just like and she didn't say, oh, he's over there, which is perhaps, I think, what they were looking for. I think they were looking for her to kind of engage with the play and kind of go, yes, I can see him, he's over there, let me go and find him now, which is perhaps what you'd expect from a neurotypical child. Bella didn't do that at all. So then when the therapist picked up the other character and she was trying to be the other character, the one with the blue top, and she was like, well, actually, I've lost my other friend, and she really tried to coax her to react in the way that you might expect. Bella did then eventually go, oh yes, okay, he's over here. And they kind of, she helped the two characters get back together, but it was not an instant kind of response as you might expect. They then went back to chatting and Bella was asked about her sibling. She was asked how her brother reacts when she plays with his toys. I think here she was looking for is Bella aware when people around her have different feelings and when they're upset and things. And Bella did just say at this point, I don't know. Now, does Bella know when people are upset? I think sometimes she does, but in this situation, she didn't respond in a way that would indicate she understood. She was asked, what makes a friend? And her response was, uh, someone that you play with. 
I did notice a lot of Bella when she was answering all this, a lot of like lying on the table. I don't know how much eye contact she was making, it was quite difficult because I was sort of sitting and they were facing each other, so I was sitting side on. She did do a lot of addressing herself in the mirror rather than addressing the therapist, I did notice a lot of that. I don't know whether that's because the mirror was quite distracting, but I know that a lot of the eye contact was with herself, her own reflection rather than the therapist. Bella was asked what makes her happy and she said if mummy says yes to things. She was asked what makes her sad, to which she responded nothing, if I see and then I know. So I'm really not sure how well she would have scored. And no, it's not like a pass or fail thing, but you know how much on the scale of autism versus neurotypical she would have scored on these questions about emotions. And then the therapist and the consultant had a little chat in the corner while Bella was given a break to play with some of these toys. But Bella lost, she had a ring, like a, a Disney, like a princess ring or something, that she was wearing when she came in and she lost it. Um, and it was just under one of the toys on the table and she got so upset, it was really awful. And she just went up to them and went, help me, help me, you have to help me find my ring. And she does get very, very upset. She melts down very, very quickly. Now, one thing I do find is she, if she's not at home, if she's in school or out and about, she does kind of really pull herself together and really pull herself out of it quite quickly. She sort of self-regulates quite well. So she did that when they found her ring for her, she did self-regulate quite quickly. If she'd been at home and kind of I guess it's more of a comfortable situation. She doesn't self-regulate like that. She needs a lot more calming down. But I think that's just, I mean, my son does that as well. He has autism, I think. When they're out and about, they're just like, they've got to pull themselves together. Whereas they to kind of let it out more at home and allow us to comfort them more as their parents. Uh, next, Bella was shown a picture of a map. She was asked to point out things on the map, things that she could see. And I must be honest, she was not very responsive in this task at all. She didn't say a great deal. Then they had a series of black and white pictures and Bella was asked to act out what was going on in the picture. So the first one was about fishing. So what they wanted her to do was to mime and use gesture to mimic fishing and she didn't do that at all. And then they, they sort of put the pictures away because that wasn't going well. And the therapist said, right, I'm an alien and I don't anything about the planet Earth, I need you to explain to me, using your actions, how you would clean your teeth. Explain to me everything about brushing your teeth. And with a fair amount of prompting, Bella did actually mime out toothpaste and brushing her teeth. So although the fishing one, and I mean, in all fairness, she doesn't really know much about fishing, but she really didn't get involved with that at all. She did do a little bit of mime and recreating the toothbrushing thing, which I guess would lean more towards the neurotypical end than the autism spectrum end because children with autism don't normally use gesture in a way that neurotypical people would. And then they had um, a bag and they had to choose five things out of the bag and make up a little story. And I guess this was looking at her imaginary play. So the therapist kind of modeled this by getting five things out of the bag and making a little story and then Bella did the same. Now Bella's story was a little more sparse than the therapist's but she is only five so I really don't know how she would have scored on this area of the assessment. If I'm honest I don't know exactly how she scored on any of it. I mean she could have done pretty well. Pretty well is the wrong way to say it isn't it because it's not a pass or fail kind of thing. She could have scored in a pretty neurotypical way in some of the elements but I think that they will have seen some signs of autism in some of the sections of the assessment, in my opinion. I won't know until we have that meeting with the assessment and let me know in the comments if you would like to see a video on the breakdown of the actual diagnosis and whether we require a diagnosis and which level of diagnosis or no or not that she actually gets. Let me know if you'd like to see that. But in my opinion, from what I know, which is not doctor level, it is just sort of well-read mum level, there were some signs of autism there. However, what I don't know is whether she will score, because it just turns out it's like, it's an addition uh, kind of game from what I can gather. There will be a number of points and a certain number of points indicates mild autism, a certain higher level of points indicates more direct, the, uh, a higher level, a number that I do not know, number of points indicates severe autism. So if I'm honest, I don't know how the results are going to turn out. I think what I've come to terms with is that whatever happens, she's going to be okay. She's the same beautiful, happy, healthy, gorgeous girl. She's still my Bella. I do 
personally believe that Will, my eight-year-old, who is incredibly bright and really thriving, would never have been doing this well without a diagnosis. I think I was concerned he wouldn't want to kind of fit in and conform in a classroom situation. He may be branded as difficult or naughty and he hasn't been any of that. The school have been amazing with him, which I'm sure they always would have been, but I think without a diagnosis, you can't understand how to help a child properly. They can quite easily just be in, end up being quite unhappy or disruptive or whatever. And that was my concern with him. My concern with Bella is not how she's doing now at all because the school has got no concerns currently how she's performing in school. Whereas William was not, was very different and from a much younger age was not kind of, well, he was just exhibiting signs of autism. A lot of people have said, if she's not struggling, why are you bothering to do this assessment? The reason that we have gone for this assessment, and I've said this previously, is because we have seen signs and I always believe that you should look into things if you have any concerns as a parent. But this magic cutoff age in our area of five, I got her referred before she was five and she was still under the health visitor. Because if you wait until they're in the school system, I've got other friends who are going through this at the moment and it's been hellish to try and get any help at all. It is a long drawn out process at the best of times. So if you've got any concerns, just get in touch sooner rather than later get on the list, get on the waiting list and get it looked at. I just know that if she's got a diagnosis, a statement of educational needs, which uh, is a separate thing, so you don't like automatically get help in school if you've got autism, but in order to apply for that, you don't have to have a diagnosis, but it's easier to get one if you have got a diagnosis. I feel that although she's doing well in school at the moment, if it gets to a stage where she needs extra help, if we've got the diagnosis, we can get that for her quite easily. If, however, we didn't bother going down the diagnosis route and then suddenly she started struggling, then we would have a very long road ahead of us to get her any help. I also have read things about teenage girls who, because girls especially mask the signs of autism very, very well, don't get diagnosed until they're in their teens, by which time they feel kind of out of place and they feel different and they often suffer from a lot of anxiety and depression because they just haven't understood why they feel so different and I didn't want that for Bella so that's why we've gone down this diagnosis route when we've done it and I guess I'll let you know how it goes so if you have got children of your own that you are thinking they may need to go down the diagnosis process or you're halfway through it or you've been through it let me know in the comments let me know where you're at with it all and how you're feeling about it all and how you're all coping. I hope you're all okay with it. If you have liked this video, please give it a massive thumbs up. Do not forget to subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified when I post new videos every Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday at 7pm. You can catch my latest video just over here and you can watch a video that YouTube thinks that you will enjoy from my channel just down here. I'll see you guys soon.